Hi everybody, it is Kaylee here and today we're going to talk about graded motor imagery. Before we get started, you're going to need a piece of paper and a writing utensil. So go ahead and pause this presentation and grab a scrap piece of paper, something to write with, and label two columns, one column right and one column left, and we will refer back to this later. Graded motor imagery is a neuro technique used by occupational therapists as part of a comprehensive plan of care to reduce pain, encourage motion, and restore typical movement patterns in individuals with impaired limb conditions. This technique has been referred to in the literature as mere visual feedback, mere therapy, and more. This theory has been broken down into a three-step process of laterality reconstruction, visual motor imagery, and finally, the most commonly recognized and applied component, mirror therapy. It is primarily used in populations where pain is restricting occupational participation, such as chronic regional pain syndrome, or CRPS, which we've talked about in class, phantom limb pain, which is usually secondary to an amputation, stroke um, patients, and other hand conditions. New research is constantly surfacing in the literature supporting this theory in previously untested populations. Let's first discuss some theoretical assumptions. Number one, the brain is plastic and has an amazing ability to reorganize itself following trauma. Do you recognize the image on this slide? It is called the homunculus. It is essentially a map in the brain that represents where sensation is processed. Trauma can trigger either a change in the map, such as the case of phantom limb pain, where the limb no longer exists on the map, or their trauma can cause a change in sensitivity at the nerve receptor sites. Using graded motor imagery, we can support an adaptive reorganization pattern by creating an illusion of pain-free movement. The next assumption is sensory motor incongruence. In this theory, it is believed that a disconnect is, exists between sensory and motor pathways, and that could be the cause of pain. The next assumption is that sensation occurs via nerve input that is mapped onto the somatosensory cortex. A variety of nerve classes exist throughout the skin, joints, muscles, and tissue that interact with the sensory cortex to give a concept of internal and external feeling. Pain is interpreted through the sensory cortex via the nerve endings. The next assumption is that conscious movement is produced by taking sensory information from the environment that has been mapped onto the somatosensory cortex and then planning in the motor cortex an execution via efferent pathways, which are the ones pathways that exit the brain, and those connect to the muscle fibers. Movement is a feedback loop of sensation and planning. So I would like you to close your eyes and extend your arm out in front of you. Now flex your elbow to 90 to create a 90 degree angle. Okay, now open your eyes. Are you at 90? Thanks to proprioception, you can position your body without visual input, although we rely on the sense of vision to reinforce our actions. Now close your eyes and feel your pencil or pen. Can you feel which end is the tip? Okay, now open your eyes. Were you correct? That is the tactile sense, also known as haptic perception, and that's how we feel the world around us. So what if you felt consistent and intense pain every time you moved your hand? Eventually, you would probably stop moving that hand unless absolutely necessary. This can lead to secondary complications of joint stiffness, decreased range of motion, decreased strength, and decreased dexterity. This leads to occupational dysfunction. Laterality is the understanding and recognition of left and right sides of the body. The literature suggests that laterality reconstruction is the precursor to decreasing pain and moving the affected limb. 
By training in laterality, the person has to form a mental representation of the limb's position, which has been to act, shown to activate the motor cortex without eliciting a painful response in the sensory cortex. This is because you're not actually moving your body, you're just imagining that movement. One study by Mosley found that the response time was longer to recognize laterality when the image corresponded to the affected limb. Practicing laterality helps restore the brain's concept of left and right by imagining your hand in that position through mirror neurons in the brain. This can be tested by using various iPhone applications. There's laterality cards that come with some of the mirror therapy kits. And then you can also even use images from a magazine. One app that's really great is called Orientate. It's a free app that you can download straight to your phone and it gives you the results as well. All right, let's practice laterality. So take out that piece of paper that you have labeled left and right. You're about to see some images of hands and I want you to look at the following images and quickly record as either a left or right hand by tailing in the appropriate column. Ready? Here we go. over the results. There should be five left and five right hands marked. If you have eight or more correct responses, you have mastered laterality, so congratulations, and now you're ready for mirror therapy. The norms are an accuracy of 80% or above, and speed for hands should be 1.5 to 2.5 seconds per image, and your accuracy and response time should be fairly symmetrical. And we talked about some of those uh, smartphone applications. Well, those automatically include speed and accuracy data in the results, making it easy to track. So what happens when a person has impaired movement and pain sensation, such as a person with CRPS or phantom limb pain? Well, according to a study by Mosley, the response time increases and accuracy decreases with laterality tasks. In the same study by Mosley, they found that the reaction time to each picture varied primarily according to the pain that would be evoked by executing that mental movement rather than as simply as a function of awkwardness of movement. So if your client has an impaired response to imagined positions, like in laterality, well, what about imagined movement of that impaired limb? So that leads us to the next step in GMI, which is visual motor imagery. So after your client has mastered laterality, it's time to move on to this step. The theory behind visual motor imagery is to prepare mo for motor movement without pain. So rather than perform the task, which may be painful due to hypersensitivity following a trauma, the client is asked to imagine movements and report back how that would feel. This process enables the individual to activate premotor neurons, which deem the activity as non-painful. However, there is some mixed research on this area. One study by McElver found that imagined movements actually increased swelling in patients with chronic regional pain syndrome, which is quite interesting. In mirror therapy, visual feedback tricks the brain to perceive the reflected healthy image as the affected limb. This visual feedback informs perception of movement, which impacts pain and motor sensation to falsely perceive the limb as being more useful than it actually is. So what you're going to want to do is set up the mirror at the patient's midline on an angle so that the reflected limb can be viewed as the affected side. The involved limb should be hidden from view behind the mirror. And then one thing you want to keep in mind is to remove any jewelry and try and cover any tattoos, piercings, or markings so that the illusion is more realistic. Next, invite the patient to imagine the limb in the mirror as their affected side. Next, instruct them to perform bilateral and synchronous movements while focusing attention on the image in the mirror. 
this technique should be performed little and often. There's a lot of literature, one study by McCabe, another by Prakansik and Straka, that suggest doing a minimum of a five minute sessions, but increase the frequency to five to six times per day. Hi everyone, it's Kaylee here, and I'm joined by my friend Jackie, and we're going to demonstrate some of the different activities that you can do using mirror therapy. So what I have set up here is the scan mirror. This is one that we use at our therapy clinic. It, you can purchase it through different uh, therapy real retailers for around $159, or you can get a camping mirror in uh, the camping department at Walmart for around $5. Or if a patient has like a stand-up mirror and they can use it in a doorway, just you want to isolate the good hand, healthy hand, and that's what the reflection that the patient's going to be looking at. And then the hidden hand is the affected hand that has impaired range of motion or they're experiencing a lot of pain, which is impacting their occupational participation. So we're going to go over the progression of different activities that you can do. What we're going to start with is you're just going to orientate the person, Jackie here, who's so lovely to help us, and she's just going to look at her hand in the mirror, and that's so that they're just, per the perception is that even though it's the mirror, they're seeing their hand as healthy. So go ahead and just move your hands around this hand, both hands, and look in the mirror and just, is that a little strange to you? Okay. Next, I'm just going to have you turn your palm up and down, and yep, and do both sides, just like that. But always keep watching that hand in the mirror, and you can go back and forth between the two. Next, we're going to do some weight bearing, so just flatten your hand on the table. And for this one, you can also have the patient stand up too and do gentle weight bearing, depending on the diagnosis and if that's indicated or contraindicated. Um, next, we'll just have you move individual fingers. And to do this, you can do some of the tendon gliding exercises that we've talked about this semester. So lift your hands up and just keep looking in the mirror. Yep, flatten like that. Touch the palm. Go up and make a hook position. And then make a fist. And then next, I'm going to have you do touch each fingertip like this. Thumb to finger. Good job. When you look in the mirror, does it feel like you're looking at the hidden hand? Mm -hmm. And the mirror neurons are being activated in our brain right now when she does that. Okay, so the next one we're going to do is tap fingers on the table. So just lift up each finger one at a time and tap them. And this works on proprioception and tactile sensation. And just gets you used to using that hand, hopefully without pain. And then finally, the next step in mirror therapy is to introduce different tools, which this can be a little bit tricky because you want to make sure that you are mimicking each side. So one thing that you can use if you're working on strengthening is sponges or putty. So what you would do is place the sponge in the hand and you can do some exercises, some different squeezing exercises, or you can have um, even do like the finger, yep, just like that, go through. And then another one that we've done at the hand clinic, depending on the goals that you're trying to accomplish with the person, is um, take a highlighter and put it in your hand and go like this. Yep, and that's working on that hook position. Very good. So those that's the progression you would use with mirror therapy. Thanks for watching. There's tons of literature on graded motor imagery. If you are interested in learning more about this topic, please check out my reference list. One really interesting study by McElver looked at cortical reorganization using MRI on individuals experiencing phantom limb pain. Guided mental imagery of imagined sensation and limb movement significantly reduced pain for subjects with phantom limb pain after six weeks of this therapy, which was pretty amazing. Another good study, there was a Cochrane systematic review. Uh, they looked at GMI programs and they were found to reduce pain in patients with 
chronic pain syndrome such as the CRPS and phantom limb pain. And then Dr. Hager is a prominent figure in the rehabilitation world on graded motor imagery theory, specific techniques, and current hot topic literature. If you are looking for any specific techniques to use for specific populations and diagnoses, I urge you to refer to her work. One of her publications is in the Journal of Hand Therapy, and it supports mirror therapy for proprioception re-education of the wrist joint. And she talks in depth on a concept of proprioceptive awareness, and she talks about it as um, the illusion of motion and function in a damaged hand through graded motor imagery. And she talks about how intention with movement through visual feedback or the illusion of visual feedback as with the mirror therapy actually stimulates receptors in the brain and the joint to form a conscious appreciation of the self. So take, take a look at her works as well. So bottom line, why would you use graded motor imagery as an OT treatment? Because the literature has shown that this technique significantly reduces pain in individuals with chronic pain conditions, especially phantom limb and CRPS. It has also been shown to increase range of motion, promote hand skills, and increase functionality in individuals with risk conditions. It promotes proprioceptive awareness during limb movement, and ultimately, graded motor imagery is highly effective, inexpensive, and widely researched. Thanks for watching and I will see you at graduation.